Hello everybody, my name is Shoelace and welcome back to another episode of Free to Play Reviews. This time we're going to be taking a look at Heroes of the Storm, a game that's based off of a mod of their original game that became its own spin-off game that became really popular, so they decided to make a game based off the game that spin off their original game. It's a MOBA from Blizzard, so let's jump straight into it. The Nexus, a trans-dimensional storm spanning its space and time. Swirling in universes and dimensions alike to see who amongst the contenders is truly the most powerful of them all. Actually, it's more along the lines of just an excuse for Blizzard to have all of its properties in a single game. So, you know, it's a pretty fun excuse. You got Warcraft, you got Starcraft 2, Diablo, and Overwatch Heroes all in the game. So, it's a pretty good excuse overall, and it's pretty damn enjoyable. So, MOBAs are pretty particular with their three-lane combat, but there are different categories in which you can play this in. For example, you can play cooperatively with characters on your team and AI on the enemy team, as well as AI all around, so you don't need the request for an online game. You can simply get in and play by yourself to practice a little bit. You can also go into training mode, which allows you to spar against one single opponent and try and get the gist of a character's basic abilities. Quick match is simple, it's just a... Uh, you versing against another group of players in a casual setting. Unranked mode, which is a more competitive draft-based system, similar to other MOBAs, except uh, there isn't any ranking attached to it, so it's a nice, slightly more competitive side of things. And then, of course, next up you have Ranked, where you're going to compete for points and try and reach Master Rank, or whatever you want to do. This, of course, requires you to actually have levels in a bunch of different characters, so you have to be pretty experienced with the game before you can jump into that. In brawls, you'll be facing off against weird, wacky teams and strange game modes with weird settings. For example, this one has a one-shot kill for Nova, which is really ridiculous. It, uh, you know, lets you get some quick cash as well as giving you an individual custom player portrait, which is kind of nice. And last but not least, you have custom game modes where you can make your own individual settings towards the game modes. The custom games aren't particularly uh, customizable in comparison to, for example, say the custom games in Overwatch currently, but they are, you know, fair enough, I suppose. You get to select which heroes are on each team, and you get to select the map, whether or not it's a team draft system or not, and that's pretty much all you can do, as far as I can tell. I know that you can add AI, but I don't know if there's any additional settings towards this. I would look forward to that in the future, though. Um, I don't see a reason why they wouldn't have something like that. So you may be asking yourselves, how many heroes are there in Here the Storm? Who are the heroes to play? Well, let me answer that for you. Oh, there's... Anubarak, Artanis, Arthas, and Ario, Diablo, Fawcett, and Merkin, Old Gaslo, Sergeant Hammer, Zarya, and the other other Zulwin, Chromos, Cast, and Sam, Blast, and Traces, Town to Go, Joanna's Fighting Rex, Sarn, Nova's Alt is Bull, with Lee, Geek, and Mid, Jahaka makes a burrow, Stitches ain't a minion, Starts to feel full, and New Year's Healing Baron, cause his stupid health is low. Green Man dies, but Lee, but we'll kill, I guarantee. Just in the grass that he ran past was Zeratul and ETC. Jaina Kale, Thrall, and Shin. Seriously, is there still no sin? Zebo sounds like a gargantuan. Sadly, Hulk can't leave its pen. Asmodan gets mad, casts his biggest black bull. Alaric dies. And I blame this failure upon you. Durandos, Luna Flare, Mrs. Mo is pretty close. Kerrigan and Ragnaros, the Gabather is really gross. Lieutenant Morale is mad of him, Martin. Brightwing blinks in, Polymorphs the Illidan. Tyrael takes his run, and the demon fills us in. Lost Vikings, hearts to kill the stinky Garrett's heart. Moon, Air, Lee, or Grain, or Ragar. Goldan's big plan thwarted by the Tasto. Texas throws a nade and gives them a burning charge. Choke all in general feels pretty bizarre. Leader of all us, Gara Zuljin. Lucio joins other watchers, following with sets at a strike coming in for the character. This review has taken way too long. I spent three hours trying to record this correctly. I'm done. So, you know, if you're mad about me qu quitting, then let me, let me just play the violin. Shit. So, now that that cringe fest is out of the way, let's jump straight into the different types of characters you can be playing. So you can play four different classes, and you can play from five different universes. For example, you have Warcraft, Starcraft, Diablo, Overwatch, and Blizzard Classics, which are pretty nice. Each one of them has their own unique style, you know, you've played them 
from previous games. They obviously, some characters may hold a special place in your heart depending on what fandom you're from, so this is kind of nice that you get to actually play as these characters. The different types of classes that you can play as first starts off with the tank, which is the big bruisery, takes a bunch of hits and hopefully doesn't die kind of get die guy whatever he's a guy who tries not to die because he has a lot of health there's also a bit of more focus for the tanks to have a lot more crowd control abilities in this moba which is a little nicer than some of the other mobas i played i don't full disclosure i don't play very many mobas so if that's a that's a trope i'm not sure but i think that's new pretty sure i might be wrong that's okay though each one of them is unique in their own way. For example, Diablo has a shit ton of health, and Misha has a bear which tanks for him. Next up, we have the McDamage faces, the Assassin, who pump out the damage and get the kills for your team. For example, you have many different types of Assassins, just like you have tanks. Chromie levels up two levels ahead of everyone else, which is kind of weird. Alarak does specific damage towards heroes, and Ragnaros has the ability to occupy the fort and become a raid boss, which is really weird. Next up we have the supports which are generally the healers of the group and try to keep the rest of the team alive. So the, you have guys like Lucio and Ario which provide heals to their team and Tassadar who provide shields. This is definitely the lowest category that I have seen in the game so far and I'd appreciate if like they actually expanded upon and improved the roster of their support list because I feel it's pretty bare bones at the moment. I would really look forward to having more support options available. Next up we have my personal favorite, the Specialist. Now as you can see, they definitely have fewer numbers than the supports, but for this one, I actually see a reason in justifying that. For example, they are Specialists in a very particular skill role. For example, Gazlo acts as a very strong area, de area denial character with uh, combinations in Siege. Abathur has the ability to occupy allied heroes from across the map and actually doesn't even participate in combat other than as a second party shooting with his symbiote. Mediv scouts across the map, unable to be targeted by the enemy team, and acts as like this ranged player compass that can set up team wipes with his ultimates. It's really weird, these specialists, and I really like the flavor that they add to this game. Um, I definitely hope for more of these, but I can see why they wouldn't, because they are so weird and different from each other, and different from every other hero. It, it just adds just a whole nother layer to this game, and I really like these guys. Generally speaking, the gameplay for this feels like any other MOBA that you might experience with a few minor changes. First of all, there is no uh, items shop that is required in this game. You simply have the character's kit, and you level up with them choosing particular talents in order to of define your roster. You do not level up and gain all of your abilities. The only ability you gain through the game is your ultimate at level 10. And you can perfect that ultimate at level 20, but obviously that's your choice and it's dependent from character to character. Another thing that's different is the leveling in this. You and your team share a level. So instead of having one enemy player being fed by someone and having just this hulk of a hero who's 10 levels higher than the rest of you, it's spread out and divided amongst the rest of your team, so it's a little bit harder to feed in this regard. It also helps because you can actually XP farm for your team, so you can go into empty lanes, wave clear a couple of minions, and you can actually catch your team up into the team fight. So it's not just a lost cause right from the get-go, you can actually have a comeback, as it were. And obviously I know that you can XP farm in other MOBAs, I'm just saying that you can do so for your entire team as a whole, as opposed to having every individual team member having to go XP farm just so that they can fight this one level 10 guy when you guys are all level 3 or something. Another difference in Heroes of the Storm from other MOBAs is the addition of map objectives. Now I'm not sure if this is in any other MOBA, as I've only played a few of the uh, more popular ones, but yeah, this, this is definitely something new to me, and I definitely appreciate what it's doing for the game. For example, on the map that I am currently on, um, every so often, a herd of Zerg will populate itself outside of the map, and you need to capture the control points at the bottom and top of the map. If you don't do so, then the enemy get a giant Zerg wave to rush your forts and towers. 
And if you capture it, then you get the same rush going towards the enemy team, which adds a different element to the game for uh, capture control. It definitely adds a little bit more than just trying to get better, more kills than the enemy. You can have more specialized tactics, mining up defenses around the control point, adding in... Um, you're adding your ultimates for a giant push towards an objective. It really adds a little bit more as opposed to just making pushes towards towers over and over again. However, this is also a disadvantage as some players will not focus on the objective and that can actually ruin the experience for you. Because unlike with MOBAs where, you know, somebody can uh, feed the enemy players and then you can waste your time for 20 minutes as you guys realize that you're inevitably going to lose, if you have a team that isn't objective focused, then you will lose the game unquestionably. I mean, there have been cases of characters of, of ignoring the objective and still winning, but it's very difficult because these things are very crucial towards you getting success out of your game. Another disadvantage of this is that it can really thin out the herd for available characters that are, you know, really worth it to be playing right now. For example, the specialist characters that I mentioned above, which more than often specialize in siege tactics and causing siege damage. On a map like this, which focuses on capturing towers in order to damage the enemy core directly, you don't need to siege towers, it's a completely optional objective aside from the main map objective, which is how you actually take out the core. And if you have a character that specializes in siege, then you may or may not be wasting your time. Of course, this is different player to player and character to character, so, you know, it's all really dependent. Now let's take a look at the talent trees. For this case, we're going to be taking a look at Nova because she's pretty easy to understand. So first off, let's look at our basic ability so we understand what we're getting into. So Snipe, you deal a shit ton of damage on a one shot. Uh, Pinning Strike, it slows down enemies on a single shot and does a little bit less damage than her Snipe ability, but it you know, make sure is that you can take down chasing targets. Hollow decoy, you create down a uh, marker that acts as like a duplicate of yourself that enemies can get confused by. And permanent cloak is her passive, which basically means Nova is permanently stealth in game. And it's really effective, like she she's always hiding in stealth, which really adds another gameplay element towards it. It also increases, she has a longer range as she's equipped with a sniper rifle, which makes sense in all accounts. And then you have her ultimates, either triple tat, which you lock on a single hero, and then you fire three shots, and that does 338 damage each for each shot that connects, so that's up to a thousand damage plus of damage that Nova can churn out in a single ultimate, which is pretty crazy, really makes her good for taking down people. Precision Strike, after 1.5 second delay, it deals 456 damage in a large area of effect with any, any enemies underneath it. It has an unlimited range, so you can use this ultimate from across the battlefield, which is pretty darn cool. Now, let's take a look at the talents to see how much this is shaken up a bit. So, obviously, Advanced Cloaking makes it so that uh, while stealth you gain 2 mana per second, increases your movement speed. Long Shot increases Pinning Shot's range by 30% and also increases the range of your next basic attack so you can really follow up and finish off a kill for anybody who's trying to run away from you as Nova. Stealth Ops, um, after being stealth for 5 seconds, Pinning Shot's slow is, is increased to 55%, so basically makes it much more brutal to unstealth with a panning shot as opposed to a snipe. So if you want to help out your team collect some kills uh, with a more melee oriented damage group then you can help them with that. Level 4 you have a bunch of buffs towards her recon. First off you have uh, increasing its cast range by 100% and its sight range by 50 so it really makes it a lot more scouty. Uh, rapid projection reduces the cooldown and the mana cost, so you can really churn out the amount of decoys that you're pumping out, keeping the enemy guessing. And then hollow stability makes it so that the uh, hollow lasts longer, so you can keep your enemies guessing which one is real between the two of you for longer. Covert mission is an active thing that you can use on enemy camps, so essentially... It gives a weird bribery system to this game, where instead of taking down jungling, uh, I guess mercenaries is what they're called in this game, but you take down troops that would fight in your lane for you. You can instead bribe them with money that you gain throughout the game, which is, you know, adds a little bit more element, makes it so the Nova can really uh, articulate a massive push all by herself if she gets lucky enough. Unfortunately, I don't think you can use this on bosses, but, I mean, it's pretty cool. 
One in the chamber, after using an ability, Nova's next basic attack within 3 seconds deals 80% extra damage. So basically, makes her basic attacks pretty darn strong. An Anti-armor shells deals 250 extra damage, but her attack speed is proportionally slower. So if you have slow moving, but high health targets, then you can switch to anti-armor shells at level 7 to really switch it up. Sniping Master basically rewards um, high-skilled players who are playing with Nova, so the more often you're able to land your snipe on enemy players, the higher damage it gets. And obviously, if you miss, then you're kind of punished for that. Triple Tap and your ultimate, you know, you just choose between those two. Uh, double Tap, Pinning Shot now has two charges, so you can slow down two enemies at the same time as opposed to just slowing down one. Uh, Psychonic Efficiency. Uh, removes snipe mana cost, so it really makes it so that Nova isn't so reliant on mana, she can just churn out the damage. It also increases its range by 10%, so I mean, you're you're pretty good, you're pretty good at shooting people now. Snipe also deals 50% damage to enemies near the impact, so that gives her a little bit more area of effect if she needs to do a little bit more wave clearing. Hit an enemy hero with snipe, reduces the cooldown by 3 seconds. Now, if you look back at the abilities, the cooldown for snipe is 6 seconds, so you're in fact having the amount of time it takes for you to get a shot off with this thing. Crippling Shot affects the armor system in this game, which basically increases the percent or decreases the percent damage that you can churn out. So she reduces 25 armor of the player, which means that player takes 25% extra damage from all incoming sources, which is pretty crazy. And the Hollow Decoy deals 40% of Nova's damage, so now you're effectively increasing your damage as a whole, and you can use your decoy as an offensive weapon instead of just as a defensive one. Uh, and then level 20 perks, which are the most powerful by far. Triple tap cooldown is reset if it kills an enemy. So you can in fact wipe an entire team by just mashing the R button if you're lucky enough. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Precision Barrage now has two charges, so you can put down two orbital strikes at the same time, which is pretty nuts. Rewind is one of those other abilities that are spread out through multiple heroes and different talent trees, but essentially it just resets the cooldowns of all your basic abilities. So if you're running low and you're in a disparate situation, you can mash an extra ability that resets all your cooldowns and you can churn out the damage again. Ghost Protocol, you can activate it, which it's another abil extra ability that you can use. So you activate the one key and now you're stealth and unrevealable to for two seconds. So even if you're damaged, you're not set back into stealth. and you can uh, actually use Nova's basic attacks and abilities without breaking stealth for that two second period. So, a lot of different bridges you can go down with Nova. You can go into a very heavy focus into single shot sniping people, or you can help out your team a lot more with the pinning shot perks. Jumping straight into the graphical settings, you have windowed full screen and windowed just regular windowed mode, which is kind of nice. If you are set to full screen, then it'll just go to the suggested resolution, which is kind of nice. You can change anti-aliasing, change the gamma, change the refresh rate, turn on and off vertical sync, which is nice. In the graphical settings, you have a crap ton of different things that you can adjust from shaders, shadows, models, lighting, reflections, indirect shadows, texture quality, post-processing, physics, terrain, movies for some reason, and effects, which is kind of nice. So you can actually turn off the physics, because um, you're going to have Lucio ragdolling off into the flying mist. It's pretty hilarious when that happens, but you know, you can do that. Uh, you can change your personal output device, you can change it so that the music plays in the background, enable reverb, put on headphone mode, which I personally do. Uh, you can increase and lower the sound quality, change the amount of sound channels available. Mouse and keyboard, you can increase the mouse sensitivity, remove, uh, reduce the mouse lag that is available, enable wheel zoom, um, Confine the mouse cursor for smart if you have multiple monitors. Uh, you can change the cursor sizer. Disable alt tab shortcut and the windows key. Now that's pretty crazy. I'm definitely a big fan of those two options because I keep on hitting those two buttons and it's driving me insane. Obviously you can also change the scrolling which is nice. Turn on and off colorblind mode, right clicking through the minimap. You definitely need that in certain situations. Um, in social, you can block people, you can block communications, and block friend requests individually. Uh, enable mature language and uh, the filters available, which is kind of nice. Uh, languages, you just change it from whatever country or origin you are from, and you can change it so that the region matches yours. And in observer mode, you can change 
a few settings. Overall, I think this is a pretty good options mode. Now let's go into the key binding settings and see how weird this will get. Now you can actually create individual profiles for individual characters, which is super cool. For example, I feel like I might use more of my keyboard if I'm playing someone like Abathur instead of just something like Tyrael, which only requires maybe just the uh, Q, W, E, and R available to me. You can change that around as you wish. But for someone like Abathur, it might be nice to have some abilities bound to the mouse. For example, in my mind, if I'm placing them around and stuff like that. There's a ton of different things that you can hotkey in here, because of course it's a MOBA, it's going to be absolutely insane. You can change this on a character to character basis, and you can change it from basic um, elements to advanced elements, even to map specific things like the Garden Terror or the Dragon Knight, which is super cool. Uh, you can have quick cast settings and a whole bunch of other things, so you can really customize this game to exactly how you want it. And that is one of my favorite things about this game, is that it did not screw around when trying to deliver a very polished system to fool around with. All right, let's take a look at the grindability for this game. Now you have a couple of things to keep in mind, and that is the three types of things that you're actually going to be grinding for. Either it be experience for your accounts that you can level up, which has a maximum level of 40. You can level up individual characters, which you can level up to level 20, and you can earn supposedly an unlimited amount of gold. I'm not really sure if there's a cap on that, but you know, get currency from all the games that you're playing. Now, early on, this game is very accessible because individual character leveling is what earns you the most gold. So, for example, if you pick up Lucio from the very start, him accelerating from level 1 to 8 is going to be pretty breezy the more consistently you play him. After that level 8 to around 9 mark, it becomes very difficult to level up your character unless you play consistent games with them. Um, I got Abathur to level 10. He's my highest level hero, and that has taken a ton of games in order to get him to that point, which has enabled me for my master skin. But other than that, it doesn't really have much uh, uh, perks other than that. I don't, I don't gain very much gold for playing Abathur anymore. So experience is definitely easy early on, but then becomes harder and harder as you, you know, eventually progress. Uh, gold is one thing that is very various depending on what kind of situation you're in. Daily quests allow you to earn a lot of gold very quickly. Unfortunately, if you don't own any character that fits a description, for example, if the quest is to play as an assassin of some sort, and you don't own an assassin, then that can be quite difficult. Same thing goes for quests asking you to play a certain universe type, so playing an Overwatch hero or a Warcraft hero. If you don't own any of those characters, or if you don't like any of those characters, it can be a little bit more difficult to earn those quests as well. They do, however, give about 200 gold on average, which is about, uh, I mean, it's a fair amount. It's not anything substantial because most character, the lowest cost heroes that you can purchase are around 2,000 gold. So you play 10 quests and you can buy yourself a hero pretty effectively. I'll cover this more in the payment section, but it definitely doesn't give out enough gold in order to purchase a hero. Um, another way that you can earn gold is by doing those weekly brawls, as I mentioned before. Those do churn out a ton of cash, depending on how much you're putting it, as well as seasonal events and uh, promotional events as well. For example, I think you all remember that Genji event that happened earlier on for this game. And if you don't, essentially what they did is that they added a new skin to Overwatch's character, Genji. And if you played a couple of games with a friend in uh, Heroes of the Storm, then you would get the skin in another Blizzard property, which is pretty cool. Now you're doing something like that currently as I'm making this review for a Warcraft mount, and they'll probably do many things like that for many other Blizzard properties. So if you're a big fan of Diablo, Starcraft, any of Blizzard's properties, then you may be willing to uh, actually play this game surely for cosmetic purposes. I'm, I don't know if that interests you or not. Okay, I'm getting off topic here. Basically, you know, it is pretty grindy the further you get into this game, but as it should be. Um, getting up into ranked is probably one of the most ridiculous things that I've ever even attempted to accomplish. You definitely have to play a lot of characters if you want to get into the competitive aspect of this game. And if you don't, if you play, if you have like a few niche four that you play on the occasion, then you're probably not going to get there at any point. Uh, 
All right, so let's take a look at the microtransactions of this game. This is something that they could definitely work on, in my opinion. Characters can be bought with gold, and so can their heroic skins, but nothing else can be bought with gold. It's simply those things. Uh, you can buy stim packs that can increase the amount of gold experience you do. You can get some bundles and some featured items, which uh, significantly reduce the cost. Um, single heroes, uh, the newest of single heroes, cost around $10, whereas the cheapest cost around $3. Non-heroic skins can cost up to $7.50, and they include three separate colorizations, and occasionally will include uh, new voiceover work as well as themed abilities. So it's a little bit more effort put in. They're definitely putting a lot of care into the cosmetics of this game, making you want to purchase them for yourself. Uh, I think one of my major complaints of this is the fact that a lot of these things, it doesn't actually show you the price tag on this. For example, the Void Speeder, you can't even purchase it if you want it. You actually have to own StarCraft II Legacies of the Void if you want to own that mount. So I find myself having to check through every single product just to make sure that I can actually purchase it sometimes. Because it doesn't actually show you the price tag on the thing. You have to click in before you can see how much something costs. I feel like that's a bit of a design feature. They should definitely have the price uh, more in the forefront so that you know people can like make a good estimation of how much it's going to cost them instead of just saying price ascending, what's the highest? It's $10, what's the cheapest? Around $3, I don't know. Uh, bundles are definitely one of the best things that they have onto the store. It ha has great saveability options. And the stim packs, I don't know if they're necessarily worth it. I had a month of it and it doesn't seem to make a difference for me personally. But if you're having a grinding issue, then you can buy one of these things for a couple of, for a bit of money and you can uh, use that to help you get through some of the grind. So the featured bundles are obviously have some discounts. One of the major things that I like about this is that if you already own a character in the bundle, it'll discount that price from the bundle itself. So for example, I had the Butcher in that one of those last packs and it actually discounted all the purchases that I would be making for the Butcher in that case. So, you know, it keeps the price even and it makes it so that you can actually purchase the bundles with the full discount instead of just having to uh, hamstring yourself by rebuying a hero or something. Overall, my main criticisms are that uh, it should definitely have the prices on the front so that you can actually see what you're purchasing instead of just showing the gold. It should also show the purchasable amount. And I also feel like they should lower the prices on individual heroes because $10 for one guy, that seems a bit excessive. You're putting a lot more value onto these bundle packs and you're not making it worth it if somebody just wants to play uh, Zul'jin, for example. They really want to try this character. You're making it a lot harder on them to just get that character. You're, you're making them purchase a pack in order to get the full uh, amount out of it. So overall, definitely needs work, but overall it's pretty forgivable. Guys, let's keep in mind that we're talking about a MOBA here. These things are bred for toxicity. Through, you know, Heroes of the Storms has no fault in this, obviously. This is just the kind of game it is. These kind of things have toxicity in them, there's no real way around that. I haven't played a MOBA that's had a good community before, so, I mean, I wouldn't keep your hopes up over this one. Obviously, it's a little bit more casual, just due to the goofy fourth wall breaking and uh, wacky natures of this game itself, but, you know, it's still, it got that elitist complex. Pe people are gonna be dicks, can't, can't stop that, so unfortunately, it's not, it's not, it's not a great community. Anyone else think we could use some mercs? Here's the Storm is definitely my favorite MOBA on the market to date. It has fun gameplay, great characters, with very interesting gameplay mechanics for each one of them that keeps the game fresh and interesting. Um, when it comes to this game, it's really easy to avoid the negative aspects because it's really easy to earn gold so that you can avoid the microtransactions, and it's really easy to avoid the toxic community, sheerly based off of the fact that it's really easy to exit the comms and avoid it. 
So out of my four rating systems, whether or not you are to pass it, try it, play it, or pay it, I recommend that you play it for this one. Like your transactions are perfect and definitely could use some work, but overall this game is a ton of fun and I guarantee you that you will have fun playing this game if your taste is anything like mine. Uh, please like and subscribe and don't forget to comment down below of what you think I should cover next in the free to play series Thank you guys so much for watching and as always have an excellent day Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed making it. If you're wondering what to watch next, I have provided two videos for you. You can click them right here. Get subscribed by clicking on that circle icon and subscribing to my channel and please follow myself and Shoelace on the social medias that you see above. Thank you. Have an excellent day.